Gong Show uh, session. So these are going to be 10 talks of five minutes uh, each. And uh, the first one is going to be Alec Bedroya from Harvard telling us about thermal deceiver and the swamp plant. So Alec, you have five minutes. Thank you. Um, let me start by thanking the organizers for organizing this great event and for giving me the opportunity to talk about my work. So today I want to talk to you about the relationship between thermodynamic aspects of the sitter space and swamp plant conditions. Um, next slide, please. Right, so let, let me start with uh, stating an observation that the sitter space seems to have some unique features that uh, seems to be different from ADS or flat space time. Um, let me just mention uh, a couple of them. First of all, for, first one is that it seems to be more difficult to construct stable the sitter and, and much more difficult to construct stable the sitter in string theory. And the second one is that the sitter space seems to have unique and strange thermal properties. And this is something that we'll circle back to later in the slides. I think whenever you have unique features, there should be some connection between them. And interestingly enough, two, around two years ago, in the context of one of these swampland con conditions called the, the transplant censorship conjecture, or uh, TCC for short, a time scale that naturally appears in the conjecture um, was equal to scrambling time, which is a time scale that is very natural in studying the thermodynamic aspects of the sitter space. And this is what I want to talk more about in the slides. Next slide, please. So let me start with a very brief review of what transplant consistorship conjecture or TCC is. So the statement of the conjecture is that if you start with Planckian fluctuations, the expansion of the universe cannot be too fast and too long such that these Planckian fluctuations stretch beyond the Hubble horizon and they freeze out and classicalize. And um, you can look at the paper for a brief review of the motivations and consequences for, for, of, of this conjecture. But um, just to like give you a universal consequence of this is that when, when you apply this conjecture to different um, to, to different realizations of the sitter space, whether it's metastable the sitter, unstable, or quintessence model, in all the cases it seems to suggest that something significant must happen in time less than one over h log one over h. And this is a time that I'll be referring to as TCC time. And just to mention it, mention it. Sí, pero por que ves el chat. El chat tiene cosas que no tienen desperdicio. Es una discusión de de qué que tiene el chat también. Por eso si entrar bueno. Someone's not okay. Thank you. Um, and so so just to mention a couple of um highly non-trivial evidence for for this conjecture from string theory. It seems that TCC implies uh the sitter conjecture and the distance conjecture with specific sharp, like explicit numbers in the asymptotics of the field space. And, um, and these, these um, inequalities have been verified for various string theory constructions. Next slide, please. So that was the swamp plan of the uh, side of the story, that that was the swamp plan side of the story for the sitter space. Now let's talk about the thermodynamic side of the story. So there are two ways that we can understand thermalization in the sitter space. One is in flat slicing coordinates and the other one is static coordinates. So in flat slicing, um, we can understand thermalization as, as uh, in the following way. As, as the modes are expanding and they go beyond the, the, the Hubble horizon, um, all of them are set uh, to, to be in the, in the Bunch Davis vacuum, which is, well behaved at small scales and is, is at thermal equilibrium. And so eventually the whole Hubble patch will be at therm thermal equilibrium. And in static coordinates, the way that we can understand this is that there is a stretch horizon sitting close to the Hubble horizon and, as, and, and that stretch horizon is interacting with um, the interior of the static patch and eventually everything thermalizes. And these two approaches agree on the time scale for thermalization. The time scale that we get from both of them is one over h log one over h. Next slide, please. <clears throat> right. So from the equality between these two time scales, and from other observations that you can um, look 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 in the paper to to see um, to 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 to, uh, to to see them in more detail, it seems that various sampling conditions are suggesting that the sitter space cannot be viewed as a um, viable thermal equilibrium background. Now, this doesn't mean that 
it doesn't have any statistical interpretation. And I just want to mention a couple of strange features for the sitter space when you do view it as a, um, as, a th as, a, as a thermal background. The first one is that um, the Hubble temperature is so low that the number of particle in, in that thermal background in the, in the whole observable universe is a order of one. And for instance, the number of photons. And secondly, the, the energy of those particles is so low that if you want to measure it, you would need an apparatus of the size of Hubble, like the observable universe. And uh, I just want to end with a small advertisement for an upcoming work that we think that there is a fundamental tension between unitarity and the sitter space when it lives longer than um, TC time. And I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Yeah, time is up. Thank you. Okay, so for questions, um, so you can either write on the chat the question during the talk or raise your hand now. So, okay, so Kumrum is asking, what is the tension with unitarity? Right, so, um, yeah, so, so the, the, the tension seems to be that if, if we want to describe um, the physics, in, in the language of the sitter complementarity, if we want to describe the physics in the static patch, um, with, with a unitary time evolution, then there, there are bounds on how, how fast the entropy must grow. And, um, and it seems that like uh, we, we, we can, if, if the sitter space lives long enough, longer than the TCC time, then um, we, lo we, we, we lose some information and we can violate those bounds that come from unitarity. So the other question is Sayatan is asking, how have you computed the thermalization time scale? Yep. So that's a that's a very good question. So in flat slicing coordinates, you can you can um, compute the thermalization time scale. You, like you can you can look at thermalization as uh, Planckian modes exiting the Hubble horizon, and you can you can calculate that that how much time it takes for Hubble like Planckian modes to exit the Hubble horizon. And that's exactly where the TCC time scale comes from, and and people have done that also in the context of the sitter complementarity. They compute the scrambling time, um, which is, I mean, the you, you need you need the thermalization time scale to be greater than scrambling time, and that also gives uh, the same time scale, one over h times log one over h. Okay, so thank you. Uh, so let's. Uh, thank oh, and yeah, and uh, please also, yeah, the the paper of Gary with Lars um, also gives a excellent uh, okay. explanation for that. Sorry, so, thanks. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, so next one is going to be Eduardo Gonzalo Badia from Madrid, from Ministerio Fisica Teorica, uh, who is going to tell us about constraints on the standard model from ADS conjectures. Uh, Eduardo, are you there? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. So thank you and thank the organizers for putting together this very nice conference. It's a great honor. To, to present my work in the strings conference for the first time. So my talk will be based on work with my supervisor, Luis Ibáñez and collaborator, Irene Valenzuela. And can you please go to the next slide? So I will start with two questions. First one was already introduced by, by Miguel and also by Luis in the, in the previous discussion, which was pretty, inter pretty interesting. So why do the scale of neutrino masses and dark energy coincide? And what is the nature of neutrinos? So we'll try to use Schwabland ideas to see how we can try to answer this question. So I consider an extension of the standard model with 300 neutrinos. And uh, if neutrinos are Dirac particles, then we will have 12 light degrees of freedom. If they are Majorana particles, then we will have somewhere between six and 12 light degrees of freedom, depending on how large their Majorana mass is. And we will see that CISO scenarios where the Majorana mass is much larger than the Dirac mass lead to inconsistencies with several Schwarmland conjectures. So please, can you go to the next slide? So in order to do that, we consider circular compactification of the standard model and require that they should fall in the landscape. We check uh, the conjectures through the effective potential of the, of the radion. And this potential will have a term coming from the dimensional reduction of the cosmological constant, plus some quantum corrections, which are simply the, the dimensional reduction of the customer energy of each of the particles in the spectrum. And since we will focus on the infrared, we will need only to consider neutrinos. Uh, can you please yeah, go to the next slide? 
So the first predictor that uh, was already considered in, in these uh, papers in the literature, it tells you that non supersymmetric ADS uh, BACWA should at best be metastable. And this, uh, this effective potential in three dimensions has not the zero BACWA. So if we assume that uh, they are stable, then they should be avoided. And uh, this can be so, uh, this can be done if uh, neutrinos are Dirac or pseudo Dirac, and uh, if their masses are smaller than the cosmological constant. But we need to assume that they are stable, and this requires UV information. So the idea of, of my talk today is to check other formula conjectures, which require only infrared information. And if we go to the next slide, the conjecture that we consider is the anticipated distance conjecture, which tells you that as the cosmological constant goes to zero, uh, a tower of states is expected to become light with a certain power alpha of the cosmological constant, and uh, this, uh, this BACWA that I was talking about before, they, they, they depend on the, on the masses of the neutrinos. So according to the conjecture, if uh, in a certain direction of field space, so we can think perhaps we're changing the path of the Higgs or the Yukawa, so that uh, the standard model is actually part, part of some scanning, um, then some, uh, if the cosmological constant uh, in three dimensions, so goes to zero, then some tower of states uh, should become light. And if we go to the next slide, uh, there uh, we have a plot uh, where this uh, effective potential is uh, shown for uh, several values of the lightest uh, neutrino mass. So we consider in this uh, figure uh, normal ERT, uh, normal order in direct neutrinos, and that the lightest neutrino mass is between 9 milli electron volts and 6 milli electron volts, as you can see in the figure. Uh, and the, the potential goes from anti uh to Minkowski and to the sitter. So, uh, According to the conjecture, uh, we should we should forbid this uh, unless some tower becomes light. So the easiest solution is that this scanning is not possible because there is an upper bound on the on the mass of the lightest neutrino. The masses of the other neutrinos are are, are fixed by the neutrino oscillation experiment. Um, so in this case, we would obtain 7.7 milli electron volts as an, as an upper bound. But then you, you, for this figure, I am assuming that such a scanning exists and the cosmological constant is not affected by this scan. So if we go to the next slide, we consider a marginal scanning where perhaps the cosmological constant changes as we change, say, the BEF of the Higgs. Now, Festina Lente um, is a conjecture that was arguing this uh, in the papers in the literature uh, that, require that, that requiring that uh, large black holes uh, should evaporate uh, in, in the zero space, every charged particle in the spectrum should have, should have a mass which is larger than the, their charge times the cosmological constant. So now we can see that if we try to do a scanning where, say, the mass of the neutrinos and the electrons, so for example, changing the BEF of the Higgs, um, then we can uh, you, we could uh, violate this, this uh, bound if the cosmological constant does not change. In fact, it should change with a power alpha greater, greater than four. And uh, in order to preserve the, the neutrinos are smaller than the cosmological constant so that we don't generate anti or vacua, the only possible scanning would be with alpha equals four. So now if we go to my last slide, we sum the results very quickly. So um, we can avoid this dangerous vacua if the total mass of neutrinos is more than 0 0.7 electron volts, while the experimental bound is 0 0.12. So we are actually pretty close to experiment. Now the simplest CISO scenario of why active neutrinos would seem inconsistent, since we, they, we need them to be Dirac. And a possible scanning arises where all of these three conjectures are consistent with alpha equals four. And this risk arises the possibility that neutrinos are perhaps part of a tower, huh? they predicted by the cosmic constant. And in any sense, it is interesting to end with the question that perhaps quantum gravity provides a deeper explanation of why uh, neutrinos are so light. Thank you. So. Okay, so thank you, Eduardo. Any question? So, uh, Sai Anton is asking how uh, the neutrino mass constraints directly omega nu. Otherwise, can we measure that in observation? How the neutrino mass constraints? So, the, the, these bounds come from cosmology, and uh, we, uh, we only put bounds on the total scale. So, um, we need the we put bounds on the lightest neutrino mass and the other uh, neutrinos, uh, we fix their mass differences uh, using uh, neutrino oscillations. So we, there's only one parameter that we can change, which is the total scale. I hope that answers your question. Okay, any other question? So if not, let's thank Eduardo again. 
And let's move on to the uh, next talk, who is uh, by Jonah Kodelflam uh, from uh, Chicago, uh, is going to tell us about distinguishing random, black, random states and black holes. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, this work is based on a paper that I wrote earlier this year and a follow-up that will appear shortly with Vladimir Nalraplansky and Shinsei Ryu. Uh, next slide, please. So Hawking told us that black holes will radiate thermal radiation. Uh, this is a breakdown of quantum mechanics as it implies that different black hole microstates with the same thermodynamic parameters will evolve to the same final state. The question I address in this work is how can we distinguish different black hole microstates when we only have access to the Hawking radiation? And this will probe physics beyond the page curve for the von Neumann entropy. Uh, next slide. In quantum, in in, uh, quantum information theory, uh, this problem goes under the name of quantum hypothesis testing. How well can we distinguish two states, rho and sigma, using a quantum measurement? For a given measurement, we conclude that we have state rho if we get measurement outcome corresponding to A, and we'll get sigma otherwise. Uh, there are two types of errors that can arise, concluding that we have state sigma when we really have state rho, and vice versa. So we seek to optimize our quantum measurement to minimize these errors. Uh, different distinguishability measures, such as the trace distance, quantify the effectiveness of this optimal measurement. Next slide, please. So here I study a different distinguishability measure called the pets renyi relative entropy, which quantifies the rate at which states can be distinguished as one is given more copies of the system. And using the replica trick, we can compute the pets renyi relative entropy for mixed states independently drawn from the Wishart ensemble. The computation boils down to a particular sum over the permutation group and can be exactly evaluated at large n using combinatorics of non-crossing partitions. In particular, representing rows as black dots and the sigmas as red dots, the dominant permutations in the sum are those that are both planar and the ones that do not connect the black and red dots. This leads to a closed form expression and, um, depending on the relative, uh, the relative uh, Hilbert space dimensions of the subsystems. Next slide, please. So using these techniques, we're able to derive uh, page curves for a large variety of distinguishability measures. As illustrative examples, I have shown the quantum relative entropy, the turnoff distance, and the fidelity. As you can see, the relative entropy is particularly simple. Uh, next slide, please. So we now study the West Coast model of black hole evaporation, which consists of uh, JT gravity decorated with end of world brains with many flavors. We can take two different evaporating black holes in this toy model with the same entropy, and we compute the relative entropy between the states of the Hawking radiation. From the gravitational path integral, we find that the relevant configurations are replica wormholes that exactly coincide with the ones that we found um, for the Haar random states, uh, namely the planar replica wormholes that do not connect end of world brains of one state with the other. Uh, next, next slide, please. So these calculations imply that prior to the page time, the microstates are non-perturbatively distinguishable. An observer needs an exponentially large number of copies of the Hawking radiation in order to reliably distinguish the black hole microstates. But after the page time, an observer only needs a single copy of the radiation to reliably distinguish microstates, though such a measurement will be very complex. And had we not included replica wormholes in the gravitational path integral, we would have found that all relative entropies are zero at all times, implying information loss. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll leave you with an advertisement to some other results from these papers. So beyond the measures already shown, we also compute the sandwiched Renyi, Renyi relative entropy and the trace distance. Uh, we studied distinguishability of static black hole microstates in ADS-CFT when one has access only to a subset of the boundary data, finding corrections to the JLMS formula. And we generalize this to generic random tensor networks using flow network techniques. And finally, we establish a subsystem eigenstate thermalization for a large class of chaotic systems, including holographic CFTs in all dimensions. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Jonah. And uh, so there's already a couple of questions uh, also by Sayantan. 
So could you please elaborate on how combinatorics play a crucial role in that replica trick? Um, yeah, so this is the um, this is what happens when you average over the uh, the Haar measure. Um, so the first calculation we did was uh, taking random states drawn from um, the Haar measure, or when you trace out a subsystem. This is uh, the Wishart ensemble, and so this is uh, standard connections between uh, perm permutations and uh, random matrix theory. And then the same kind of structures show up. Um, in the gravity um, due to uh, the different ways that um, the replicas in gravity can connect. So there's, there's a connection between these hard random states and these replica wormholes. He's also asking, uh, could you please also comment on POVM, particularly why is it necessary in this context? Um, so what I wanted to do was um, say, say you're given um, the state of the radiation and you're given that quantum state and you want to determine what state it's in. And so um, what we're allowed to do in general is uh, apply any positive operator value measurement. Um, and so, yeah, that's how, we'll, that's how we determine uh, what state we have. I'm not sure if that was exactly the answer uh, or the answer is exactly the question now. Okay, so uh, thanks. Uh, so let's see if there's uh, any other question. Okay, we can maybe discuss later at the end of the, of the gong show if you want. Um, okay, so if there's no other question, so let's uh, thank John again. And uh, uh, so let's move to the next uh, talk. Uh, by Erez Urbach from Weizmann, who will tell us about uh, the entanglement entropy of typical pure states and uh, replica wormholes. Erez, are you there? Erez? Um, okay. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi. Okay. Hi. Sorry. Good. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you have five slide. minutes. Great. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, yes. So uh, we are considering a two-dimensional QFT on a circle, uh, and in this theory, we will consider the von Neumann entanglement entropy on an interval a between zero and five, where five is the angular coordinate on the circle, and we'll consider the entropy for pure typical states. So for pure typical states, you expect the page curve in the von Neumann entropy as function of phi, as you can see in the, top, in the bottom right here. And by that, I don't mean that we have a black hole of radiation, just that the von Neumann entropy as a function of phi has a linear increase and then a linear decrease when the interval reach half the system size. We will reproduce this page curve for the average von Neumann entropy. And by average, I mean an average over a specific ensemble of high energy states uh, with typical energy one over beta that we'll assume to be uh, larger than one. Next slide, please. Thanks. So first a reminder, if you want to ask about the interval entanglement entropy for the thermal, thermal density metrics, then the replica trick instructs you to calculate the path integral over uh, the following geometry of n toi with a replicated line uh, between them, between zero and five. This is what you see on the top here. And if you further uh, want to use the holographic dictionary, then you're instructed to find a gravity solution that its uh, boundary is the geometry I was just describing. So let me describe the solution. If you take one of the toa here and slice it in the middle, you get a filled ring uh, that I drawn below. So this is a black hole solution and the black hole, the Euclidean black hole uh, horizon is the dashed uh, black circle you see in the middle. And from the boundary, you have the replicated line between zero and five that you need to extend to, into the bulk into a replicated surface that I drawn in blue. And uh, as a result, you get that the von Neumann entropy eventually is proportional to the, bound to the length of the boundary of this replicated surface, what I called x in the picture. In this case, the length, the length of this x is, as you can see from the picture, because the replicated surface touches the horizon, its length is, is proportional to phi. And you get that the thermal uh, von Neumann entropy as function of phi is linearly proportional to phi. 
This is what you see on the right. And next slide, please. Now, uh, moving to the pure, pure state, for a specific ensemble of pure states, you can show that the average entropy is given by similar perf integral after you use the CFT replica trick. The difference is as follows. You again have n different toi and a replicated line between them. But now you need to further identify the n inner circles that I drawn here as a blue dashed line. So you have for each replica this circle. And in the path integral for the field, you need to constrain the fields such that the value of the field is going to be equal on all these circles. So you can think about it as some kind of path integral on singular geometry. Next slide, please. Given this path integral of a singular geometry, you can now ask its value using the same holographic dictionary. Only now, because you have this singular boundary condition uh, at this inner circle, you're allowed to have two different types of solutions. The first type of solution is the same thermal solution that you saw before, where the replicated line uh, from the boundary is extended only up to the Euclidean horizon. This is what you see on the left. And as we just described, it gives an increasing entropy. But because we have this uh, real boundary condition, you also have another solution. This is what you see on the right, where the replicated surface is extended inside the horizon up to the second boundary of, the, of your spatial slice. And this is because the, the other boundary in the middle, that's the blue circle, uh, has this uh, weird looking singular geometry from the boundary perspective. You can call it a wormhole solution because this one phi is very small. Uh, all the geometry behind the horizon is uh, connected in non-trivial way through the replicas. And this, if you calculate it, you get that this other contributes a decreasing entropy. And, uh, and as a result, you reproduce the page curve for the average von Neumann entropy. As you can see in the next slide, right? So this is the average von Neumann entropy that we got, where the thermal saddle contributes for short intervals, and the wormhole, what we call the wormhole solution, contributes a uh, dominant at large intervals. And as a result, you get uh, the curve that you expected from the CFT side. Let me just mention again that uh, this is not an evaporation process of, not, of any black hole, but we calculate here it's just the entanglement entropy of the, on the CFT side. And secondly, we didn't use any kind of island formula to get the page curve. The two solutions are both were kind of RT solutions from the rich, from the like old type, if you want, just coming from two different kind of boundary conditions uh, from the CFT because of this singular geometry. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Aris. Um, any question? So Sayantan is asking, um, instead of formal, if you have recently proposed hard formal scenarios, then how will you do the job? So warmer without averaging gravity. Um, I'm not sure I understood the question. Uh, are you asking how to see those solutions uh, without so, averaging? So Sayantan, if you want, you can just open your mic and ask uh, the question in words. Well, in any case, let me just say that uh, I don't know how to get these solutions uh, without the averaging I considered. Uh, well, uh, so how, how at, at do the you do the CFT, yeah, uh, at, at the CFT, at the CFT side, you can do the replica trick for any density matrix period, uh, even if it's not defined for a path integral. So in this case, we have a specific path integral formulation for the state. If you just perform the normal replica trick, you get a, spe a specific prescription uh, of perfect integral to calculate, and this is what I showed you. Okay. Any other question? So, if not, uh, let's uh, thank Eris again. And so we move on to uh, the next talk. Uh, oops, sorry. Sorry, just a second.
Okay, so the next talk is uh, uh, by uh, Suman Kundu from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. And he'll tell us Hello. about bounds on regular growth of flat space scattering from bounds on chaos. Hello. Suman, thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. I have done this work in collaboration with Diksha Chandorkar, Subham Dattu Choudhury, and Professor Siraj Minwala. Next slide, please. So let's start. It's a very interesting problem to classify all possible consistent graviton S matrices. We already know many examples of consistent S matrices in string theory. Compactifications in various Calabio manifolds gives rise to different scattering amplitudes. This makes the classification problem very difficult to pursue. But if we consider G string goes to zero limit, then we see that all known different string theory answers reduces to only three possibilities. These are Einstein gravity, type two theory, and heterotic string theory. This gives a very good place to start the classification. And one can ask how many consistent classical S matrix are there except these three. Choudhury and collaborators have conjectured that there are none except those three known examples. By classical, we mean the amplitude will have only pole type singularities. This is still a very ambitious statement to prove because we have to consider infinite number of spin exchanges. We can further restrict and say that the only consistent classical gravitational S matrix whose exchange poles are bounded in spin is the Einstein S matrix. Next slide, please. In D less than equal to six, this conjecture is indeed true, provided the S matrix will have only finite number of poles and it satisfies a physically motivated constraint on S matrix in regel limit. This constraint is named as classical regel growth conjecture or CRJ conjecture. I'll briefly mention the statement. It says the S matrix of a consistent classical theory never grows faster than S square at fixed T. But is this CRG conjecture true? We have given a clear argument for CRG conjecture using the bound on chaos and ADS CFT for contact interactions of spinning particles. Next slide, please. In this work, we have considered a four point function of massless spinning particles in ADS. In this picture, you can see four insertion points P1 and P3 below at time tau, P2 and P4 above at an angle theta. These are the only parameters in the problem. As we change tau from pi to zero, it explores total three different causal configurations. Next slide, please. When tau starts from pi, it is in the Euclidean configuration. Once tau crosses pi minus theta, it enters causally regge configuration where chaos bound applies. It says the normalized boundary correlator cannot grow faster than one by theta square in small theta limit. Finally, when tau is less than theta, it enters the causally scattering state where actual scattering can take place in the bulk and we get a bulk point singularity. Here we have identified the coefficient of bulk point singularity to the flat space S matrix. This is a typical equation for various spinning cases. It was done for scalars before. We have extended it for photons and gravitons. The row divergence shown in red is the bulk point singularity. In regi limit, sigma is taken to zero and determines the regi behavior. A still law of omega shown in blue is the flat space S matrix in regi limit of the same interaction. Next slide, please. In sigma goes to zero limit, the same correlator takes this form shown in the box. It says the leading term sigma scaling is totally decoupled from the function of rho and the sigma behavior doesn't change with the causal structure, which effectively determines the regis scaling. Now, all we need to do is prove that the function h of rho is an analytic function of rho extended over two configurations. The analytic continuous and contour is shown in the figure. The above and the below part of the contour is in the regis sheet and scattering sheet respectively. Now we got something nice. Two configurations are related by an analytic continuation. This implies the function of rho cannot suddenly become entirely zero in the scattering sheet if it is not zero in the regis sheet. This relates chaos bound in regis sheet to the CRG bound on flat space S matrix in scattering sheet. So to summarize what we have achieved, well, first we have derived the relation between leading rho singularity in ADS correlator and a flat space S matrix for spin one and spin two. And second, we have proved that if chaos bound is true in, in regis sheet, then CRG bound is also true for in scattering sheet for any contact interactions. Next slide, please. We, we certainly have some limitations in our calculation. 
since we did this calculation only for contact interactions it is important to prove the crg bound also for exchange diagrams we have taken the flat space limit of ads and used ads cft to show the crg conjecture in the bulk it would be very satisfying to get direct bulk argument for the crg conjecture without use of any ads cft i'll stop here thank you for your attention so thank you very much suman um Okay, so we have a question uh, again by Sayantan. Uh, my very basic question is: What do you, what do we mean or understand uh, from chaotic S matrix? Is this completely coming from a non-perturbative calculation, uh, or so? No, uh, we 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 are totally doing a part of perturbative calculation, and and we are just taking the. Uh, the leading uh, we are actually calculating a four point correlation function and the four point correlation function is calculated only for uh, in the tree level so it is it is definitely perturbative we are not considering any any non perturbative thing but the now is that is that answer your question <clears throat> okay, okay so thank we have you. a question from from the institute uh, yes, oh. my question. First of all, very interesting argument. Thank you. But it's not totally obvious to me that you, your calculation was only good for contact interactions, because even a non-contact interaction, except due to massless exchange possibly, involves only a limited length scale bounded by the uh, Compton wavelength of the exchange particles. And yes. in ADS, your infinity was infinitely far away. So I wonder if you didn't actually prove more than you claimed. Okay, so we have done this calculation only for contact diagrams. You are asking what what will happen if we if we do the exchange calculation? Like, sorry, yes, I'm basically saying I could be, of course, very likely totally wrong, but I thought that um, exchange of massive particles would not be much different from a contact coupling. Of course, ah, exchange, so, of so, massless, exchange of massless particles is different, but I assume that you know what are the massless particles. So you hardly even have to analyze massless exchange separately. Yes. So, so first I should say that we have not done the massless case. The massless, uh, uh, like the, the external particles are, are massless in our calculation and we have only considered contact interaction. So both exchange and the ma massive case we have excluded, but I can uh, so in the massive case the prob uh, we are, we are actually doing a high, very high energy calculation. So okay, at at very sorry sorry when I said massless or massive I meant for the exchanged particle. If you generalize from your contact calculation to an exchange, I'm very naive yes. and perhaps completely wrong, but I would have thought that as long as the exchanged particle is massive, it wouldn't be much different from a contact interaction. Perhaps that's confused. I see. Um, of course, you could also worry about massless exchanges, but those are so limited that you would know what they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if we do, definitely we'll do the massive exchange also, but I, I okay. okay. Actually, I, I don't have clear argument for this. Uh, that what will happen if 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 the exchange particle is massive okay maybe we can uh, no right now table this discussion for later okay so yeah. uh, let's uh, thank suman uh, again okay. thank you very much and uh, so let's move to the uh, next talk by amadullah zaid from uh, the indian institute of science will tell us uh, about quantum field theory and the uh, Biberbach conjecture. Amadullah, are you there? Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, thank you the organizers. So I'll be talking about quantum field theory and the Biberbach conjecture. And this is based on these two work, uh, one with uh, one in the Shina and uh, another is with uh, Parthiv Haldar and one in the Shina. Next slide, please. 
So um, if a function uh, f of z is a univalent and uh, we can normalize it uh, such that it's Taylor coefficient of z is equals to one, then uh, other Taylor coefficients that b n, if it's univalent, then it's, uh, its absolute value is bounded by, uh, b n is bounded by n. Absolute value of b n is bounded by n. And if f of z is a univalent function, then uh, Absolute value of the uh, absolute value of this function is also uh, bounded from two sides, and uh, a univalent function uh, is a function that is um, uh, the in a domain uh, it's a holomorphic and uh, one to one. Next slide, please. So we are going to relate this uh, univalent function to the scattering amplitudes. So um, from uh, fully crossing symmetry, one can expand the amplitude in powers of uh, around x equals to zero, y equals to zero, where x and y are the uh, uh, crossing symmetry combination of the Mandelstam invariants. Inv invariants. Um, x is the quadratic and y is the cubic uh, Mandelstam invariants. And uh, these w's are the Wilson coefficients. And uh, um, we parameterize this uh, uh, Mandelstam invariance uh, S and T as a function of Z and A, such that we can write this X uh, and Y in this fashion. And uh, now our amplitude uh, is a function of A and Z. And uh, we expand the amplitude around Z equals to zero. And Taylor coefficients are given by this alpha N, A to the power two N. And this alpha N and uh, uh, this Wilson coefficients are related. Uh, by these equations. Next slide, please. And now uh, for fully crossing symmetric amplitude, one can write down a fixed uh, A dispersion relation for the amplitude. And dispersion relation is given by this, uh, where A is the S channel discontinuity and H is the kernel. And uh, from uh, if H is basically fixed and one can show that H is a invalid function. And uh, a, the, one can show that for a certain range of A, this uh, H channel discontinuity is uh, uh, non-negative. And from this information, uh, from this crossing symmetry, in, uh, crossing symmetry and the unitarity, one can prove the following things. Uh, one of them is the Bevere kind of bounds that uh, Taylor coefficients of this uh, amplitude uh, around Z equals to zero. This alpha N uh, modulus of this alpha N is bounded uh, by this N. And uh, there is a, a two-sided bound on the amplitude, uh, modulus of the amplitude. And uh, for a small a, one can prove that the amplitude is, is itself a unit function. Next slide. So uh, from n equals to two, uh, and that means the second Taylor coefficients, alpha two, uh, one can get the bounds on the Wilson coefficients. Uh, here is the bound for the first Wilson coefficients, W01, and W is one zero ratio of these two should be in between these two values. And the figure, uh, you can see that this black uh, dot, dot light line are the bounds and uh, this uh, uh, all the colored uh, dots are basically the uh, pioneer metrics uh, obtained from the pioneer metric bootstrap. They all actually satisfy these bounds. Uh, next slide, please. So um, uh, there is an ongoing work by uh, Anindo and Prashant, uh, which uh, uses the uh, 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 theory of typically real invalence functions that gives a, gives us uh, gives a very uh, rigorous and tighter bounds on the Wilson coefficients. Here are some examples. The first column is uh, using the analysis of typically real invalent functions, and second is uh, using the SDPP. Um, SDPP results, uh, the lower bounds and the upper bounds. Uh, thank you. So thank you very much, Hamadullah. And uh, uh, so any question? Yeah, Sasha. Um, yes, thanks uh, for the talk. Uh, I wanted to ask if uh, if your amplitude is not fully crossing symmetric, can you still apply these ideas? Yes, uh, in in, in, uh, in this upcoming work by Anindo and uh, Prashant, they are actually 
uh, trying to work with the two channel symmetry and still you can get uh, i mean uh, there you have to assume certain uh, certain properties of the amplitude that it should not grow faster than uh, s so you can then apply this uh, same instrumentation and you can get the similar kind of bounds and uh, amplitude is still uh, uh, univalent you can show this bounds yeah that's possible using only two channel symmetry is possible Any other question? I have another question for maybe also. Sure. Okay, can, can you apply these ideas to CFTs? And uh, do you know any examples of CFT correlators or explicit scattering amplitudes which you know are univalent? Yeah, yeah, I, we, we can, uh, uh, for, uh, I mean, in Melanie space, we, you can apply these techniques and uh, similar story goes there. and. Uh, uh, we had uh, some uh, initial observations that uh, 2D Ising model uh, million amplitudes actually ob obeys all these bounds, yeah. uh, as well as 3D Ising models. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, if there's no other question, uh, let's thank Hamadullah again. And uh, thank you. So, and let's move to the next speaker who is Sruti Narayanan from Harvard. And she'll tell us about state operator correspondence uh, in Celestial Conformal Field Theory. Are you thank there? You. Yes, I'm here. Uh, Can hi. you hear me? Sure, yes. Okay, great. Uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, this opportunity to speak. I'm gonna be talking about some work done in collaboration with Aaron Crawley, Noel Miller, and Andy Sherminger. Next slide, please. So uh, four-dimensional Lorentz symmetries in the bulk are manifest as two-dimensional conformal symmetries on the boundary, which allows us to uh, recast four-dimensional S-matrix elements as two-dimensional conformal correlators in what we call the celestial conformal field theory that lives on the boundary sphere. And operators in the CCFT correspond, therefore, to both incoming and outgoing bulk fields that puncture the celestial sphere at a given point. So in this talk, I'll try to find a bulk product that makes sense as a CFT two-point function and use the state operator correspondence to define operators in the CFT. I'll then apply the uh, BPZ construction to this two-point function to get an inner product on 2D states and discuss the implications for 2D versus 4D scattering. Next slide, please. So we start by considering solutions to the free 4D scalar massless wave equation, and we know that it admits a conserved current, J mu, which allows us to construct a symplectic product. But we could also modify solutions to the wave equation. For example, if we complex conjugate one of the fields, then it gives us the usual Klein-Gordon inner product that's used in particular in the normalization of conformal primary wave functions. And conformal primary wave functions have been very useful because they allow us to explicitly transform from a momentum basis to a conformal primary basis, which allows us to explicitly see the connection between 4D S matrix elements and 2D conformal correlators. In particular, for here it's shown for massless scalars. This transformation is given by a Mellon transform. And one should note that analogous currents and products can be constructed for arbitrary spin, and what follows can also be done for massive fields. It just requires a more complicated integral transform. Next slide, please. Right, so one would assume that a bulk product between two conformal, wave, conformal primary wave functions could be thought of as a transformed S matrix element, so a CFT two point function. However, when we actually calculate the Klein Gordon inner product between two of these wave functions, we get a delta function in W1 and W2, which is not what you, ex you usually expect for a 2D CFT two point function, rather, we expect a power law. Additionally, the adjoint of the uh, conformal, genera conformal generators, ln, looks like minus ln bar under the klein gordon inner product. And this is another alien property that we experience via this inner product, as shown by this red alien in this box. And so we try to attempt to fix both of these things. In particular, if we want to fix the first problem, we can introduce the shadow transform, which has proven to be ubiquitous in discussions of celestial amplitudes. 
And in particular, it serves as a modification to this inner product where we shadow one of the fields in the symplectic product. And it turns out that if we do that, we do actually get something that has the power law structure of the usual 2D CFD two point function. Next slide, please. So now that we have something that looks like a 2D CFT two point function, we can talk about the state operator correspondence. This is just done like it usually is in 2D CFT, except here what we have to do is we have to construct Northern states and Southern states. And this is important for our Hilbert space discussion that I'll end with. So Northern state is a state that enters at the South pole of the past celestial sphere and exits at the North pole of the future celestial sphere. Uh, similarly, a Southern state, it moves in the opposite direction. In terms of a mode expansion, this means that a northern state is expanded around W equals zero, whereas a southern state is expanded around W equals infinity. And together, these two define the two different Hilbert spaces that we find on our celestial sphere. Next slide, please. So now that we have operators, we can take this shadow product, which looks like a 2D CFD two-point function. We can contour integrate appropriately to get a BPZ in our product between these two operators. And in particular, it has two properties that we normally expect in a uh, 2D CFT in our, uh, in our product. It has, as shown in blue here, the constraint that the conformal weights of the two operators have to be the same. And also that uh, the chronic, we have the chronic or delta function in the red box, which tells us that the adjoints of the operators are given by shadowed operators of the same conformal dimension, okay? So this uh, tells us that we need to not just consider unshadowed or shadowed fields in our Hilbert space in the CCFT, we actually have to consider some kind of combination of shadowed and unshadowed fields. Finally, if we take this inner product, we can compute that ln dagger is L minus N as one expects in a 2D CFT. So we've also fixed that problem alongside this one. Next slide, please. So this reformulates the scattering problem because in four dimensions, we usually have an in Hilbert space and an out Hilbert space where we have all of our states coming at scry minus and all of our states going out at scry plus. And the 4DS matrix is a map between these two spaces versus in two dimensions, we have our operators in the Northern Hilbert space that correspond to both operators of ingoing and outgoing particles as well as in the Southern Hilbert space. And our 2D inner product actually maps between these two Hilbert spaces. So whereas the information that is contained in the 2D picture is the same as the information contained in the 4D picture, the organization of the, uh, the data is slightly different and hopefully we can learn something from that difference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suti. Uh, so any question? Is this product positive? Sorry? Is it positive definite, the inner, the inner product you are defining? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so the because it's constructed from the, um, if you, so if you consider positive frequency states, then yes, it's positive, but you can also consider negative frequency states, in which case it's negative definite. Um, but it seems like that doesn't actually pose a huge problem in this picture because uh, the same is true of the inner product between the control and primary wave functions. Any other question? So, okay, so if not, let's uh, thank Sruti again for the nice talk. And uh, let's uh, move on to the next talk by Akash Goel from Princeton, who will tell us about uh, uh, towards a string dual of SYK. Akash, are you there? Uh, yep, yep. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you for giving me the chance to speak here. So I will be describing this work with uh, Herman Verlinde. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please, yeah. Uh, so the SYK model is a model of interacting Majorana fermions. In particular, the Hamiltonian is described by a P fermion interaction term with couplings J that are drawn from a Gaussian random distribution. And the disorder average SYK model can be described in terms of an action that is just uh, with bilocal fields uh, G and sigma that live naturally on the torus. And in particular, in the double scaling limits, this action simplifies to a Lorentzian Liouville theory. 
And over the past few years, this model has been uh, shown to be a very useful toy model, for instance, to study the physics of black holes. And that motivates us to try to embed this model within string theory. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, the context in which we are going to be studying this problem is in minimal string theory, which uh, Thomas reviewed this morning. So it's described by minimal matter coupled to UV gravity as well as ghosts. And uh, the operators are uh, in this theory are the physical tachyon operators, as well as the operators at ghost number zero, which generate the ground ring of the theory. And there are two types of brains. There are the continuous FZZT brains, which extend uh, in the Liouville direction from the point of view of the target space and are labeled by the uh, boundary cosmological constant, as well as the discrete ZZ brains. And these brains are known to live naturally on a semi-classical target space which is a well-studied Riemann surface from the point of view of the spectral curve of the corresponding matrix model. So the matrix model in question is the two matrix model, uh, which is described by N by N matrices A and B, uh, as well as potentials VP and VQ that are polynomials of order uh, P and Q respectively. And uh, in order to make contact with the minimal string, one needs to tune these potentials to the P comma Q at multi-critical point in a double scaling limit. Next slide, please. Uh, it is also known how to insert FZZT brains from the point of view of the corresponding matrix model, namely by inserting these determinant operators. And if one inserts multiple determinant operators, uh, sorry, if you insert multiple FZZT brains, uh, we can introduce a matrix XQ that lives on this, uh, the flavor space of the locations of these FZZT brains. And uh, one can also uh, trade off this determinant for an integral over complex fermions, where these fermions have an index that lives on the ZZ brain and another index that lives on the FZZT brain. So that you can think of these fermions as open strings that stretch between the two types of brains. So here's a construction. We will be considering the P comma one theory with Q FZZT brains, which has this action. And in this case, it is uh, easy to integrate out the degrees of freedom that live on the ZZ brain, namely the matrices A and B, and get an effective description in terms of the fermions. Uh, one can further use the scalar flavor map to introduce degrees of freedom that live purely on the FZZT brain. And this has been studied well in the double scaling limit and is known to be equivalent to the Kansevich matrix integral. However, let me stress that in order to obtain our SYK phase, we are going to be focusing on the large Q limit. Next slide, please. Uh, so after integrating out the A and B fields, we obtain a matrix version of the SYK time. So now we need to introduce elements to make contact with the SYK time direction. And so to that end, let us introduce uh, these matrices U and V that satisfy this algebra. U is the clock matrix, which is diagonal and whose uh, elements are the qth roots of unity, and v is the shift matrix. So any q by q matrix G can be expanded in powers of u and v, and one can extract the coefficients of this expansion to build a function G of u v, whose Fourier mode, uh, whose Fourier coefficients are these coefficients in that expansion, and uh, which lives naturally on the torus of period two pi. So under this map from q, q plus q uh, matrices to functions on the torus. Uh, the matrix product maps to a star product, and the trace of the matrices maps to an integral over the coordinates on the torus. One can also extend this map to uh, vectors, and one can also use these properties to, uh, to carefully construct uh, a, 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 a matrix XQ such that it maps to a discretization of a discretized derivative in the U direction in units of H bar. And it turns out that it's also important to uh, construct uh, in our construction to uh, limit to modes of psi, which are uh, integer multiples of square root uh, Q in this expansion. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, after accounting for this uh, subtlety, one obtains an action that uh, takes this form. And uh, if we assume that we can take a smooth continuum limit, namely the large Q limit or the H bar going to zero limit, one obtains, one can replace the star products in this, uh, in this action with uh, uh, the ordinary product of functions. And so uh, we conclude with this uh, phase diagram that we obtain where we have an SYK-like physics in, the, in the, uh, the regime that is dominated by the FZZT brains. And we have the minimal string phase in the large, uh, in the large N limit. And let me also mention that uh, in the double scaling limit of the SYK model, 
uh, one can uh, reduce this action to a sum over two Liouville theories with complex central charges that sum to 26. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Akash. So questions? So there's already a couple of questions in the chat, but uh, let's see if there's a live question. Okay, otherwise, uh, so Sayantan is asking, um, if you fix the coupling J, then is it possible to find the string dual in that case? Uh, not that I know. So here we have the simple, um, if you, if you, uh, the advantage of doing the working with the disorder average theory is that you have a model that lives naturally in two dimensions. Uh, and um, right, so we had this map to the non commutative torus uh, that's not that, yeah, that uh, it seems a bit harder to uh, get uh, an effective description in terms of the uh, a particular realization of the SYK model. In particular, it seems that uh, the string theory knows only about the disorder average and not the particular instance of the SYK model, at least in our construction. Okay, so that's the question by Shi. Uh, hi, uh, what is the role of time in this duality? Uh, uh, so time, uh, so uh, in what sense do you mean? So uh, the time, that we have an emergent time, right? So that's, that comes uh, uh, from, on one the, side. from the Q, uh, yeah, from the from the FZZT space, yeah. Sorry, from the FZZT, how, how is time so emergent? So you should think of, yeah, so you should think of the, at finite Q, uh, you should think of it, uh, this model, the target space as living on a discretization of the torus in units of H bar, where H bar is two pi over Q. And as you, as you take, uh, and so this torus is the time cross time in S by K. So, because uh, because you see that uh, the SYK time is uh, the Euclidean time is periodic with period beta. So this two dimensional effective theory looks lives on the torus of uh, a beta cross beta, right? And uh, once you go to the non-commutative torus and you take the Q to infinity limit, you get a continuum uh, torus, which uh, where the the skew variable essentially transmutes to the continuous time variable. In that case, which and this Q, this Q parameterizes the number of FCCT brains in the construction. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thanks. So let's thank Akash again. Thanks. And uh, now let's uh, move on to uh, the next speaker, Sheng Hao Zhong from uh, Imperial, who will tell us about uh, magnetic quivers and superconformal theories. Um, so, Sheng Hao, are you there? Yes. Uh, thank you okay. for having me. Um, hi. hi, I would like to talk about magnetic quivers and superconformal field theories. And this is based on a few works in collaboration with Antoine Bourget, Santiago Cabrera, Simone Giancomelli, Julius Griminger, Amihan Hanani, Marcus Sperling, Gabby Zafir, and Tom Zayek. Next slide, please. So we are looking at 4DN equals 2 and 5DN equals 1 as CFDs. Now, these theories have a very rich vacuum structure, which makes it worthwhile to study the moduli space of vacua called the Higgs branch. However, the Higgs branch of these SCFTs can often be difficult to study directly. So here, we take a more indirect approach. For each 4dn equals 2 or 5dn equals 1 theory, we will try to find the corresponding magnetic quiver and study that object instead. So a magnetic quiver is defined as a 3D n equals four gauge theory whose Coulomb branch is the same as the Higgs branch of your 4D or 5D theory. Now this makes the magnetic quiver a very nice object to study because in the last decade or so, there have been many new tools developed specifically to understand the Coulomb branch of 3D n equals four gauge theories. So now we're able to use these tools to study the Coulomb branch of the magnetic quiver, and hence indirectly study the Higgs branch of your desired 4D n equals 2 or 5D n equals 1 SCFT. Now, the question is given an SCFT, how do we find this corresponding magnetic quiver? Well, a natural way to do so is using a brain system. Next slide, please. So let's begin in 5D. Let's take a SU3 gauge theory with six flavors and zero transignments level. 
and I take this gauge coupling to, the, to infinity so that I'm at the super conformal fixed point. Now, the brain system, which describes this SCFT, involves five brains and seven brains. So on the left-hand side, we have the brain system. We have a circle with a cross, which represents seven brains that stretches into your computer screen. And we have the different colored lines, which represents five brains stretch between the seven brains and can move along them. So the position of the five brains along the seven brains was then parameterized the Higgs branch of our SCFT. And from this brain system, I can immediately read off the corresponding 3D magnetic quiver. For example, the different stacked five brains will now correspond to different unitary gauge groups in the magnetic quiver. And the rank of the unitary gauge groups depends on how many five brains are stacked together. Next slide, please. So to summarize, the Higgs branch of this 5D n equals one theory is the same as the Coulomb branch of this 3D n equals four magnetic quiver, which we obtained using the Brink system. Next slide, please. So now we can go one step further. We can take this 5D n equals one SCFT, compactifies on a circle with a Z2 twist. And this is known to produce a 4D n equals two SCFT with a C3A1 global symmetry. And we can repeat this procedure directly on the magnetic quiver. We take the magnetic quiver of the 5D theory and we identify a Z2 symmetry on the quiver and fold the legs along the symmetry. The resulting folded quiver will have non-simply laced edges represented by little arrows. And the Coulomb branch of this folded magnetic quiver is indeed the same as the Higgs branch of the 4D n equals two SCFT. And we can repeat this procedure by folding magnetic quivers of other 5D n equals one SCFTs. And this exercise allows us to find all the magnetic quivers corresponding to the classification of 4D n equals two rank one SCFTs. Next slide, please. So now that we have the magnetic quivers, we can use it to study the Higgs branch in more detail. For instance, we can explore the different phases of the Higgs branch. Watch it, each phase, there's a different set of massless states and there's transitions between one phase and the other. So this information can be encoded in the phase diagram. So the Higgs branch phase diagram of our 5D n equals one and 4D n equals two theories are given on the right-hand side. The black dots represents the different phases and the blue lines are the transitions from one phase to the other. And again, this phase diagram can be obtained directly from the magnetic quiver. So this uses a purely diagrammical process called quiver subtraction, where you take the magnetic quiver, subtract a smaller quiver from it, and repeating this process will give you the phase diagram with all the phases and transitions, which nicely encodes this geometry of the Higgs branch. Thank you. So thanks, thanks a lot. Um, so, any question for Cheng Hao? Yeah, author, please. So, can you get your magnetic quivers also by reducing your five dimensional theories to three dimensions and then just doing a mirror symmetry through the three dimensional brain constructions? So, um, so from the 5D to the 4D, it was uh, quite lucky that we can just fold the magnetic quivers and obtain the results. And we don't really have such an um, analogous procedure from 5D to 3D. So for example, the magnetic quivers, um, the Higgs branch of the magnetic quivers can not really compare to the Coulomb branch of the, well, the 4D or the 5D theories. So we don't have the exact 3D mirror symmetries yet. Any other question? Okay, so if not, let's thank uh, Sheng Hao again. Thank you. And uh, let's move on to the last talk, uh, which is going to be shared between um, Yang Rui Hu and uh, Azel Mack from Brown. And they'll tell us uh, about solving a 40-year-old problem, 11-dimensional superfields. So please. Thank you. So hi, everyone. I'm Hazel. Hi, uh, I'm Yang Rui. 
Uh, first, thanks to the organizer for giving us this opportunity to present our work. So today we are going to tell you a story about a very fundamental question in supersymmetry, that is how to write an 11 dimensional superfield. This problem has been hanging around for 40 years and last year we solved it. This is based on our series of work collaborated with Dreamgate. Next slide, please. So the concept of superfield was introduced in 1974 by Salem and Strafty and it was demonstrated in 4D. So a few years later, 11D onshore supergravity was constructed. One very natural question would be, what is the offshore version? Instead of irreducible supergravity, let us focus on the easier reducible supergravity and one approach would utilize 11 dimensional unconstrained superfields. This leads us to ask, what are the component fields sitting in an 11 dimensional superfield? This very fundamental problem, however, has been left unsolved for 40 years. Last year, we de decided to abandon the traditional gamma matrix method and invoke some Lie algebra techniques and also computational tools such as Liard and Susino Mathematica packages. And for the very first time in history, the structures of 11D superfields were revealed. I will let Yang Wei to describe the setup of the problem. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, let's start with the scalar superfield in 11 dimension under the superspace framework. Then a scalar superfield can be written in a schematic form on the screen via the theta expansion. So we have level zero to level 32. Then since the component fields have to transform covariantly under the Lorentz group, then the question is how to decompose the red prefactors here into SO110 irreducible representations? And this question is highly non-trivial not only since there are two to the 32 total degrees of freedom. And also if we construct them directly using the 1024 gamma matrices, we have to deal with tons of fierce identities. Even worse, at higher levels, there is no systematic way to write down Lorentz covariant theta monomials. So this sounds like a dead end, right? No. Two observations allow us to get around these issues, and Hazel will show you the first one. Next slide, please. So the first observation goes as follows. Um, Grassmann coordinates anti-compute, so a product of them will be totally anti-symmetric. Since the total degrees of freedom of certain tensors with certain symmetries can be described by Young tableaus, we could represent level n as a column of n boxes. But Young tableau has another meaning. Any Young table can be mapped bijectively to a SUN irreducible representation. Therefore, we could interpret each level as a SU32 irreducible representation. And this sets the stage for Yang Wei to show you the magic. Next slide. Well, um, based on this observation, the question reduced to how to project a SU32 irreb into a direct sum of SO110 irreps. It happens that SO110 is a subalgebra of SU32. So branching rules by definition give us the answer. Here are two examples for quadratic and cubic levels. Both the art and Susino package can carry out these calculations. And the numbers here are dimensions of the irreps. In fact, we not only know the dimensions, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between irreps and the field variables. From the Zinken labels and other related branching rules, we actually know index structures and irreducible conditions of all corresponding field variables. This is achieved by introducing bosonic and spinorial onto blues and using some graphical rules to visualize the branching rules. And you can check this paper for details. Next slide, please. So, with all these tools, we find the Lorentz descriptions of all the components fields of an 11 dimensional scalar superfield. So here is an identical graph. Each node is a one node uh, SO110 irreducible representation. And the number in the node is the dimension of that irrep. And as Yang Wei just mentioned, we can translate them to Duncan labels, Yang tableaus, and also index notations. White nodes are bosons and black nodes are fermions. And the black links between them are transformation laws. So from bottom to top, 
we have the component fields from level zero to level 32, and they are symmetric about level 16. Um, so it will form some kind of diamond shape. Uh, we only, here we only show up to level five due to limited space. So do you think we only know the component contents of the 11 dimensional scalar superfield? The answer is no, because by using Brighton-Lewis method, we can actually obtain the component contents of any superfield by doing the tensor product uh, of the scalar superfield with the irreducible representation of that index structure. Next slide, please. Now let's think about the supergravity. Uh, in the Nordstrom limit, we only consider the conformal compensator V, the scalar superfield. So the complete field content of the 11D scalar superfield that Hesse just showed you provides a clear picture of the Nordstrom supergravity. Also, we found possible embeddings for conformal graviton, gravitino, as well as three forms occur in the middle levels of the scalar superfield. Moreover, if we write the scalar superfield as a derivative of V alpha and use the branch null approach, we found that V alpha actually contains the complete component field of the Poincaré-Vier bind at level 17. These findings highly suggest that the scalar superfield plays the role as both conformal compensator and semi-prepotentials. And the superfield V alpha is the prepotential candidate taking a surprisingly simple form. With all of that, we finally reach a possible starting point of writing an 11D superfield supergravity theory, which potentially enables the study of M theory corrections and beyond. This is all we want to present today, and thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, so there's a question by uh, Shi. Uh, hi. So uh, you know, there, there's a 2009 work by Martin Sederwall in which he constructed a fully supersymmetric offshell action for 11D supergravity using pure spinner superspace. Can you comment on the connection between that and your work? I. Yes, so their work is actually kind of orthogonal to our approach. Since we starting from the unconstrained uh, superfield constructions, so we do not impose any constraint like the uh, pure spinner approach and an other approach like using the, uh, starting the super geometry perspective. So we uh, kind of orthogonal. But but I mean, is there a, is there some disadvantage of uh, Sellerwall's approach that your approach would overcome? I mean, what what is the problem with uh, with that pure spinner uh, super super space formulation? So like um, so for the pure spinner, you have to uh, impose the pure spinner condition. For the uh, for the super space, right? No, that's just constraint on, on the on the variables. It's like harmonic super yes. space. I, I mean that that's, right. uh, but the pure spinner super fields are perfectly well defined. I, I mean, of, of course you can have yes, constraint uh, variables. I mean, yes, that. you can you you can uh, uh, proceed like this problem by that approach. We we don't wanna to consider that kind of constraint since we we want to. Uh, understand this problem from the inside variables like the prepotentials how and then we go to the construct the uh like the covariant derivatives and calculate the field strengths and then to go to the supergravity so we use another approach but yes you can use the pure spinner to do some work in that direction nathan The advantage of Martin's work is that he has an action. Do you have a proposed action for your super fields? That's so, a good uh, question. <laughs> yes, uh, go ahead, Hazel. Yeah, so so um, we for, actually follow the spirit of Brighton Lula, who like in, uh, in 1977, he have written down a 4D super graffiti theory, which is reducible, and then like he, takes a factor superfield and tensor product with a factor. So they get a graviton that is reducible and is unconstrained and is, uh, he didn't write down the action. 
So in our approach, we also didn't write down an action. Um, and I think to achieve that, maybe the first thing that we want to do is to take this unconstrained, uh, this result is actually unconstrained super few, and actually put some constraint in and then uh, make it to irreducible super gravity and then, and then we can think about action. Do you know the dimension of your scalar in this superfield? Uh, sorry, uh, it, like we are in eleven dimensions, so yeah. So it's a very negative dimensional scalar. I guess your your graviton is at level sixteen, so maybe it's minus eight or something like that. The dimension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, maybe it will be a little negative, but because um, we haven't actually written down the action and mm -hmm. like for for the comment that I just mentioned, like uh, M, M theory correction and stuff, we are thinking of doing it in like using equation of motion, like Bianchi identities in this, instead of like going to action. So, okay. yes, Thank if you. you count the uh, dimension like in the action perspective, Yes, maybe some of the component fields will carry the negative uh, dimensions and even it's impossible to write down the Lagrangian. But the, the point is that for now, we didn't impose any constraint. And if we go that direction and try to write down the action, we have to impose some constraint to like uh, make the super space smaller to write the uh, proper action. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. So let's thank uh, Yang Rui and Hazel again, and all other uh, speakers of uh, today's session. Thank you. And uh, thank you. I also so wanted to uh, remind you that there is a Slack channel uh, for the Gong Show uh, on Slack, so that uh, there were a few questions that uh, were left maybe uh, unasked and unanswered, and uh, you can maybe continue the discussion uh, there if you want. Otherwise, we adjourn to tomorrow uh, morning or afternoon, depending. Okay, so thank you all, and uh, see you uh, to the, tomorrow. Thank you. All right.